off the talk, I thought I would say, yes, I am the person responsible for the big mess all around you, just to get that out of the way. Um, but it all goes, it all fits together, if you will, um, as part of a plan for the campus that we're working on. So today I want to talk a little bit about how we've gotten to where we are today and what we're working on today and how we think it's going to end up in the future. And I kind of look at this as an interactive talk, if you will. So if you see a question, you have some, see something along the way, it'll be a lot easier just to raise your hand while we're in the middle of the talk and ask the question then than it will be to try and remember it to the end of the 40 slides that I have and then have us go back. So feel free to stop if you have a question along the way. Now, when you talk about the Madison campus, a lot of people go back to when we first started with our first building, North Hall, in the 1850s. But I actually go back further than that. I go back 10,000 years. And the reason I go back 10,000 years is the number one feature of this campus is that unlike any other campus in the world that we know of, we have four miles of lakeshore from a glacial lake, Lake Mendota, on our campus. And that all came about from the glaciers. That the last Wisconsin lobe of the glaciers was 10,000 years ago. Before it hit, this is what Lake Mendota's boundary looked like before the glacier hit. Um, so you can see this was the same kind of undulating land that the driftless area of southwestern Wisconsin is today, that the glaciers never hit. And Picnic Point was an escarpment about 400 feet above the Yahara River Valley that moved around here. And we had some high points, which, which later became the Isthmus. And here's the high points that are later it became Maple Bluff. But really, it was the glacier that transformed our setting. And for us as planning the campus, we have to think about our setting as the first thing that we're working on. So about 8,000 years ago, this was really a gigantic chain of lakes uh, because the water level was about 20 feet higher than as the glacier uh, continued to melt and move out. And part of the effect of this glacier is so dramatic because even here at the end of the lobe of the glacier, uh, the geologists estimate that that glacier was 1,400 feet thick. So that's like a 14-story building at the end of the glacier, solid ice and rock, gouging out uh, the landscape. And when it retreated, it left behind Lake Mendota, Lake Monona, Wabisa, and Kaganza. So that setting is important to us, and also parts of the setting on campus are, re are reminders of the glacier as well. So now we'll fast forward 9,850 years to about 1850. Um, and when we started with the campus, it was on a glacial drumlin, which is a, a deposit of glacial till as the, glacials as the glaciers were moved. And there are two major glacial drumlins in the city of Madison. One has the Capitol on top of it. One has Bascom, Hill, Bascom Hall on top of it. Um, and so these were the promontory points as, as Madison developed. And this was, we were known as the College on the Hill. So that's where we went. Probably we look at the Native American history here going back almost 1,500 years, uh, 12 to 1,500 years. And this was a very sacred spot, these same glacial drumlins and hillside and picnic point. And actually, the whole lake district area was a sacred spot for the Native Americans who lived here, which is why we are so rich in both mounds and archaeological sites. In fact, when we did our cultural landscape study, we have 41 Native American archaeological sites on campus. Uh, many of which we haven't really fully explored yet, um, and we're looking at those. So that all developed uh, before that. Uh, we have an inventory of them on our website, uh, at FPNM, under probably less than half a dozen of them are signed now, but one of the projects we're looking at is identifying bo the, the, the mounds that we have on campus um, as part of uh, uh, honoring the Native Americans who have been here before us using the same land. So here we are in, in the, in eight, and this shows the glacial drumlins left behind. So the Bascom Hill and Ag Hall in 1900 when it was built uh, were on those two hillsides left behind by the glaciers. And they are a prominent part of our campus, something that we have been working on ever since we started. Uh, the campus has really grown in one of two different ways. We've either uh, had adjacent uh, crummy student housing next to campus uh, that we bought and tore down and replaced it with university buildings. Or, as we move west, we took uh, agricultural experiment land all the where we had 
uh, land all the way from Ag Hall all the way out here to Shorewood where we are today. And gradually the campus has filled in the Ag Experiment land and we have taken out uh, student housing that is next to campus. So this is a picture of Bascom Hall. It had a dome in the turn of the century uh, that burned down in 1916. And this is the housing that was where the Historical Society is today, down in Library Mall, as an example of the kind of change that has gone on in time. And then this is, looks back, uh, once again, around the turn of the century. And you can, to me, this is where you see the disconnect between the state government and the university right here, because when the city planners uh, uh, put the, laid out State Street, they took it all the way down and it got to the bottom of Park Street, and then Bascom Hill tilted off to the side. So we've never been in alignment with state government. And it's, it's, a, it's a geographical problem more than a political problem. Um, lots of changes have occurred over time. One of the points in my talk is this campus has always been changing. Uh, and the things that we think now are iconic buildings or settings many times were improvements on what happened in the past. And one example is the Memorial Union, which, was which eventually was located here where these houses are. And in fact, Library Mall was originally the home of the football team and the track team and the baseball team uh, before they moved out to the State Fair Park um, by the engineering campus. So once again, change is constant along the way. Um, as part of doing our master plan, we evaluated uh, the master plans that have been going on. There are seven or eight of them over the last 150 years. This one is from 1907. And you can see, uh, now that we've found the wireless network, just, okay, thanks. And you can see in this plan, it was really influenced by the Chicago Exposition, the City Beautiful movement that had really classical triangle entryway down at the bottom of Park Street and kind of cloistered buildings proposed along University Avenue. Um, and out of this plan, we found a couple things that we really liked that we could recapture. Bascom Hill has always been a feature and a defining point of campus, but when Ag Hall was built and when Consumer Science, now Human Ecology, was built, they were set way back off of Linden Street in order to create another green mall that came from Charter Street all the way back to the horse barn. Well, in the 1960s, when Van Huys was plunked down here on the corner, it ruined that whole landscape plan, if you will, for that part of campus. Well, Van Huys is one of the buildings in our plan that in the next 20 years is going to be removed. Um, and when it is, we're going to back up the replacement building and line it up with Human Ecology and Ag Hall and recapture this big green lawn along Linden Drive, a, a great feature of this plan in 1907 that we can accomplish over 100 years later. The, the, the theme of constantly changing is borne out by this picture. This was the original Memorial Union before the, the theater wing was built and before the terrace was built. So here are two things that we think of all the time as iconic parts of campus. When the Memorial Union opened in 1929, there was no terrace. There was nothing. It was literally a sidewalk along the lake and some grass. And then the Union Theater was added later. And the terrace evolved over the next 40 or 50 years into the thing we love so much now today. And another example of how change happens. This is an example of uh, how the campus developed. So this was a residential area where the uh, hospital was originally built. So here's Henry Mall going up to Ag Hall, and you can see the three original science buildings, the very first biochemistry building here, um, Ag Journalism. Uh, and this was all developed. This was the old nursing school. And eventually, we bought up all this land and tore down the houses and built the hospital and social work and the other things that were put in there. That's how the campus developed. Uh, this fellow, I believe, as a precedent setting, was the first backup appointment. <laughs> That's a laugh line. Uh, he obviously screwed up in the College of Agriculture and was assigned the position of scarecrow in the cornfield. Uh, uh, but this also shows the far end of campus at the turn of the century. So here's Hiram Smith uh, and the greenhouses. Um, and this was all the rest, ag fields all the way to Shorewood Hills. Um, at the turn of the century that gradually de became developed. And it turns out we've always had parking problems uh, on campus. Here's Henry Mall and the area around Russell Labs completely overrun with cars, none of which had permits, I'm sure. Um, and then we've, the landscape has also been an important part of how we've developed. This is the Lakeshore Path, really the way it was for hundreds of years. That part of campus and, and Picnic Point are, were an oak savanna 
which is an ecology where the Native Americans would burn the grasses, and the, when they burned the prairie grasses, the oaks were the trees that would remain. And so there'd be scattered stands of oak in an oak savanna in the, and then prairie grass beneath it. That's what we had around Picnic Point, around Frouchy Point, and down the Lakeshore Path. Yes? And it was. This was part of the Madison Park and Pleasure Drive uh, connection. So people drove along the Lakeshore Path and out to Picnic Point. And the reason they called it Picnic Point was it was all very open then. Uh, so when you look at historic pictures of Picnic Point, here we are about the 1920s, it's an oak savanna. It has wide openings, great views everywhere, which is why it got its name. It was a great place to walk out and you felt like you were in the middle of the lake. What has happened in the last 40 or 50 years is we've become overrun by invasive species. Honeysuckle and buckthorn have clogged the lakeshore path, have clogged Picnic Point and Second Point to the point where when you walk along the lakeshore path, you can't even hardly see the lake in the summertime, and likewise Picnic Point. So one of the things we're doing is, is working on starting to restore the oak savanna in those areas so that the views and the ecology that were originally here are restored and we get rid of the invasive species. And I'll show you some pictures of that along the way. We've also had a lot of fun on campus. This is the largest ski jump in the Midwest uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. This was on Muir Knoll. It was a 90-foot ski jump. And it was there for 35, 40 years, put up by hoofers every winter. And this would be used. Here, here's a ski jumper coming off and landing on Muir Knoll. You can see all of the people waiting for the agony of defeat uh, as they crash land on the bottom. But this was a, this was a world-class ski jumping location until the risk managers got a hold of it. And, <laughs> and then uh, that, that was the end of it in the mid-50s. Likewise, Hoofers also built a toboggan run down from Washburn Observatory, down that really steep slope, a quarter mile out on the lake, they put plywood and built this toboggan run. Now, if you think this looks like fun in the daytime, I was told it's even more fun at night, uh, where you'd pay a nickel for each toboggan run, and at night, you had to have a bell on the front of your toboggan, so if someone was down here, they would get out of the way before you ran over them with your bell on the toboggan. So we have a lot of things going on in construction. This is kind of how we got to where we are. And today, we have a lot of construction going on. These are the nine major projects we're working on. They're worth over $600 million uh, on campus today. And about, of that, about 70% of that money is not from the state. It's from gifts, it's from federal grants, um, it is from program revenue, from housing, uh, from the unions, and from athletics. So all of these projects largely are funded by the institution itself. And I'm just going to go across the campus from west to east. The American Family Children's Hospital is depicted here. That will be open this summer up uh, on the far west side. You folks are familiar with that as you come in and out. Uh, on the other side of Highland Drive, so that will be done this summer. Um, we're in the midst of building the first of the new interdisciplinary research center uh, buildings right next to where we are today in the Learning Center. Um, this five-story research tower will eventually be, have two seven-story companions uh, pointing like fingers out from the hospital towards the Wiseman Center. Um, and this first tower will be done uh, in a little over a year. And then the base of the second tower is being built at the same time. So you're seeing all of that come out. The idea, of course, of this whole area is to migrate the medical school and the health sciences in general and con consolidate them on, the, on this west side of campus. So we've got the clinical care of the hospital, the research arm uh, of all the health sciences, the teaching of the medical school, the nursing school, the pharmacy school, Wiseman all in, a, in a, an adjacent area. Um, it is really helpful as we're competing for federal grants to have research, education, and clinical care literally on the same block. Um, it is a very powerful, functional engine for us, uh, so much so that we believe that this will have to expand this after about 10 years and actually add more health sciences buildings, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, along the way, we have the new vet diagnostic lab. This is tucked back on Willow Creek uh, behind the vet school. This just opened this year. Uh, the new microbial science building where we're combining bacteriology and medical microbiology um, and some of foods, food research. All is moving into the building that replaced E.B. Fred. So this is on Linden Drive. That will be moving into that this summer. 
Uh, the new addition of the business school on the corner of University Avenue and Park Street is under construction. That will be done in about a year. Um, I joked with the dean that I told him I thought this looked like a temple to money. Uh, he, he said, what's wrong with that? This is the business school. Uh, so this will dramatically change the look. We are, here you can see this addition is completely true to the architecture of the original Granger Hall, so that the entire block will have that same development. Um, the new housing where the green fields were on the corner of Dayton Street and Park is part of the replacement of the two towers of Og Hall. Uh, the other part of that, uh, so Og Hall will come down in uh, this, this fall. It will be deconstructed uh, floor by floor and 85% of the material will be recycled um, and reused in a variety of things. And at the end of the day, this site will be a park. Um, that area of campus is really overbuilt and with all the student housing there, we need more green space. Yes? Ag Hall actually opened in 1965. It has a terrible roof. The windows leak. It's an energy conservation nightmare. The floor to floor height is only nine feet, so we can't really go in and renovate it. The concrete structure is falling apart. Uh, all the mechanical equipment is in need of more than $20 million of repair. The foundation is in trouble, um, and it's a fire hazard. Other than that, it's a pretty good building. Um, yeah, well, and we, and we actually studied these. What you're going to see in this plan is that a lot of the buildings that were built in the 60s are on our targets for removal because they're less expensive to tear down and replace than they are to try and go in and fix. Unlike 100-year-old buildings like Chamberlain, Mechanical Engineering, Sterling Hall, Bascom, uh, all of those buildings have nice, generous floor-to-floor -floor heights. They have great exterior structures. We can go in and remodel them and give them another 100 years of life much more cost-effectively than replacing them. So in the next 20 years, as you see all this development, you'll see a number of 40-year-old buildings taken down and replaced, and almost all of the 100-year-old buildings restored. Yes? Actually, that's it, a great question, and what we have done is in evaluating the whole campus, what we've said is we need to build the exteriors and the structures of the 21st century buildings the way we did 100 years ago. Very robust, things that can last 100 years, with generous floor-to-floor -floor heights so we can go back in and remodel them. Likewise, we're not spending as much money on building giant concrete or, or block walls on the interiors so that we, it is actually less expensive 20 years from now to go in and rebuild them or remodel them if, if technologies change, as research changes, even as maybe the use of the building changes. So we're, the 21st century is the hybrid. It's the, it's the 100 year old exterior and foundation classically designed to be last 100 years and then a less expensive interior that is more adaptable. That's completely not true. Buildings are not disposable. We have too many programs that require the buildings to function. We, in the buildings that we have targeted to be removed in the next 20 years, we're still maintaining those. But we're not going in and completely rebuilding the mechanical equipment, for example. Uh, so they'll be, continue to be functional right up until they're taken down. But we're not doing a major remodeling, major re investments in those buildings. The rest of the maintenance uh, of campus um, is we've we, in the last four years, we've spent almost $80 million on maintenance projects on this campus. In the past, we were only spending, we're spending less than $10 million a year. So we've more than doubled our maintenance volume while we have been also doubling uh, our construction volume at the same time. So folks are busy. Well, I would like to tell you we have a direct plan. We know we are in trouble. And the, the cuts that we have had to absorb on the campus in the last four years have rippled everywhere. And while we're adding over a million gross square feet to campus, our maintenance budget has been cut $20 million. And while we used to have 600 custodians, we have 400 custodians today. Um, this is not a sustainable trend. And we're working with the chancellor's office and the, and the vice chancellor for administration to put together a business plan to reinvest in staff and maintenance on campus. And part of that um, is we're hoping to see some progress in this budget we have going right now. But for the last four years, it has been on decline. There's no question about it. Every building we're building on campus as a minimum is LEED certified. Every building, every new building. Um, 
In the past, because in order to get the LEED certification plaque, you had to hire a third party architect to come in and do the scorecard and then send it in. I have not spent the several hundred thousand dollars to do the LEED certification plaque because I'd rather have that several hundred thousand dollars go to the building. But I have been convinced over the last three years that by our user groups uh, on campus that they want the plaque. They want it, they're proud of the fact that it is, uh, it is a sustainable building that we're opening. And so from now on, we will actually go for that certification for opening every new building. And the, it will vary from LEED certified, we will have some silver, we may have a couple of golds. Um, so we will have LEED certification at some level for every new building. And frankly, we have been for the last 15 years. When you go back and look at what we've invested in, the energy conservation uh, measures alone score us almost enough points to be LEED certified for every building we've built in the last 20 years. Not because we were trying to make a political statement, because it just makes sense uh, to use those sustainable energy equipment practices, high R value, good day lighting, um, lots of insulation, high efficiency motors, um, storm windows, all of those things uh, that add points to lead also save us money um, and make for a more livable building. So we're committed to that as well. So Og Hall comes down in the fall and uh, this is the new University Square, what it will look like uh, in about a year. So you can see the structure going up right now. This is another pretty unique project in that only about 15% of this land is owned by the university. The other 85% was the private shopping mall that used to be there. And we've done a, a joint, de joint development where the bottom floors will be private parking but open to the public. Um, and then there'll be two floors of commercial and retail all the way around the block. This is private housing, this L-shaped building. And this is the university condominium, if you will, from floors 3 to 12 um, on this area. Into that area, we're going to move uh, the Bursar Student Financial Aids, the Registrar, all the student organizations, um, and the Student Health Service. So it will really be a consolidated student services tower right on the East Campus Mall between Johnson and University Avenue where all those services really want to be. And so uh, about a year and a half from now, we'll be moving into that. Um, and that, so this part uh, will be our, what we own as a condominium in this entire development. Um, and this is what it looks like from the ground floor. So we'll have a pretty exciting area of commercial and retail restaurants right next to our East Campus Mall, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then these are all our student service offices, including a studio for the student radio station poking out right into the mall with some pretty fantastic views. Um, mechanical engineering is a great example of 100-year-old buildings. We're giving another 100-year life. Uh, we built a new addition in the old sawtooth in the U of the mechanical engineering. Um, and that is done now and it looks like this. So it's a beautiful piece of architecture that goes with the mechanical engineering. A some really beautiful stonework added in. And then when you go back, what we're doing now is renovating that 95-year-old uh, mechanical engineering for another 100 years. When we do this, we're spending about half as much money as it we would spend if we were replacing and building a new building. So it is not only a historic preservation, but it's just smart investment um, along the way. Uh, the Press House has a new housing piece right behind their Press House Chapel, behind where the Peterson Building is today. That will open next fall. That's a private development, but one that we joined in the planning for that. Uh, the Park Street development has been open now since last fall. And here we have all the Peterson office building replacement with a parking ramp underneath and more residence halls here. So these residence halls combined with the Dayton Street residence halls will replace the thousand beds we're losing when we tear down Og Hall. And so that development is done. It also gives us a new visitor center, which I encourage you to check out. If you're meeting people from out of town and you want to have a meeting, uh, there's two meeting rooms right next to the welcome center that you can use pretty inexpensively. And then there's all this visitor parking right there. It's a whole new concept for us on campus, a welcome center next to parking. So we're, we're, we're not sure whether this will work or not, but we're going to give it a try. Um, of course, uh, the Camp Randall project is done, paid entirely from athletic revenues and gift funds. And then we have a whole host of projects that are in the pipeline, if you will, for the next four to six years. Another $800 million of projects uh, along the way. 
and I'll go through those quickly as well. Um, we're going to, just for fun and excitement, you think it's bad around here uh, with the utility project that we're putting in for the next year and a half. We're building University Square, we're tearing down Og Hall, uh, we're tearing down the Peterson Building in the fall, we're building a new addition to the Chazen, um, we're building a new Dayton Street, and then we're putting three blocks of underground utilities for 35 feet in the trench right up and down what used to be Murray Mall, all next year. So that's going to be really exciting. Uh, but in the end, um, it's going to be this beautiful 66-foot wide pedestrian mall linking uh, the Union Terrace, the Library Mall, and all going all the way down past the Cole Center to Regent Street with all these student services, residence halls, and museums, and music performance spaces lined up along the pedestrian mall. So for the lower campus, uh, this will be a very transformational artery uh, without cars. It should be really a spectacular change. And this entire mall and all the projects I talked about will be done in five years. So really a major difference. Yes? Uh, we have, we're adding two floors to the Taj Garage. We have underground parking, two floors underneath University Square. We added 350 spaces at Park Street um, as well when that opened. And so the net effect of what we have built here is there's actually about 300 more parking spaces when we're done than what we have now. This is Park Street. The mall, the, actually, it's, the, there's little pieces of Murray Street. Murray. Uh, Lake is the next one down. So if, this is the Peterson Building today, and this is the, the Chazen, and then this will be the new University Square, and this is Vilas. So it runs right down that spine. Now the first piece of this is done, right behind the Park Street development. We finished uh, that half a block of the mall, and now we're building the, the mall up uh, between the surf and the new uh, new residence hall on Dayton Street, and then when we get done with this three-block utility project, we'll put the mall on top of it. Uh, so it'll be pretty transformational. This is the project you're all familiar with. We just started. Um, we'll, we'll have a detour here. The Willow Creek Bridge will be closed, and you'll be crossing down by Linden, and that Linden Drive connection to Walnut Street is how you'll get into this area and go back to Observatory Drive. Um, then you can move up on Walnut Street and then we will always be able to drive around Highland but the two lanes that are open will be different because we'll be working on one third of the street at a time um, as we go through to keep all of this open. But at the end of the day there'll be some big improvements. Not only will we have a, a new connection from the Cogen plant into the hospital and this whole medical science center. Right now the hospital has one line for steam and chilled water. This is not good. Uh, so this will give us redundant heating and cooling and power and electrical duct banks and IT for this whole complex that we desperately need. And we're building the capacity big enough that we won't have to go back in here for more than 20 years. And there's a lot of capacity underneath this road when we're done. The other logical thing we're doing is that for some reason, Observatory Drive was closed and made into a dead-end lot 85. I don't know why that happened, but we're going to fix it. When this utility project is done, uh, we'll be reconnecting Observatory Drive so that it lines up with the street light right at the entrance of the hospital. Um, so the logical wayfinding of going east-west on campus will be restored. Um, and it will also take a lot of pressure off driving in Walnut Street and out, and out uh, this way as well because just people will go where it's most logical and we've designed the capacity to meet that. So in the, in the summer of 2009, this will all be reconnected. Um, and there will be a new roundabout rather than a traffic light there because uh, we, that is going to provide for a more sustainable traffic pattern and we don't have to queue everybody up behind the lights. Yes? Actually, the research and the experience we have shown about roundabouts is it slows all the traffic down uh, and it is very pedestrian friendly because there's a median at every, at every crossing. So instead of having to go from curb to curb, you, you can go from halfway, and there's safe stops. So there's like eight crossings instead of four, and they're all very short. The, and this is a one-lane roundabout. 
So there won't be multiple lanes, it'll be one lane. Exactly, so, it'll be very, so having a one lane roundabout is really much safer than in the research than a, a signed intersection. But it will be a new thing for everybody, so we're, we're, people are always worried about that, and we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, along the edge of Lakeshore Path, we're going to add some new residence halls, and that's actually what, one of the things I was fighting about in the Capitol today, is getting the approval to build these new residence halls. We're taking the design of the old 1930s Lakeshore dorms and reusing them. And we, the other thing we're doing is, as we have this great lake, and we have built with our back to the lake, for 150 years, now we're turning around, we're facing the lake, so we're gonna tear down the food research building and make that a green space, quadrangle, so that all these buildings now will have access to views on the lake and a big green space face, facing the lake. Let's take advantage of this great setting. The entire city did that, and it was really, Genesis that was in the 1870s to 1890s when the lakes were sewage drump, dumping grounds, and the lakes were nasty, and so, People didn't want to look at them, people didn't want to see them, and, you, and everything was back to the lake, which is why we don't have any marinas or bars or restaurants out on the lake, because when that whole area of the city developed, it was a pretty stinky mess. Now that that has been transformed, we now have to reorient our planning vision, if you will, to turn around, and you're starting to see that in the city as well, uh, with, with Monona Terrace, uh, with the developments on Machinery Row, uh, more and more now, people are figuring out lakefront is good. Uh, and we want to take advantage of that. And also, green space is good. Our campus is organized around green space, particularly north of University Avenue. So as we develop, we want to keep building in more green space. We also need more recreational space. The natatorium is really woefully under capacity. So we're looking at a major addition to the natatorium with a lot more cardio indoor uh, turf fields, uh, as well as more basketball courts, and less locker rooms. It turns out that students don't shower and change at where they work out anymore. They go back to their rooms. So we have all this wasted space. We have these massive locker rooms with four people in them, and they're all us, faculty and staff. Um, and so we're gonna reconvert some of those into more active workout space, and then more space on the east side of the NAT. And I would expect we'll see a referendum on that next year as we finish the plans for that. Likewise, the surf needs some added capacity. That's a tighter site. We're starting to think of how we do that. We really want to have a better entrance on the surf rather than it, it feels like it does, it's a building without a door. If you go at it now, you go, where the heck do you go in here? But with the new East Campus Mall being right next to it, uh, building something uh, monumental that says, here's where you come in to work out uh, might be something we want to incorporate. Uh, human ecology is another project. Once again, that's in this budget. We're down working on that. We want to build a Beaux-Arts addition to human ecology uh, to the west of the site, and then go back in and renovate that 100-year-old building um, after the new addition is done. Once again, you're seeing a lot of these ad historically accurate additions and then going back in and renovating. So we're getting more space, and we're using, that, uh, using those historic building structures. Uh, the Institute for Discovery in the center part of campus and the New Union South are the other things that we're working on right now. So this is Johnson Street and this is University Avenue and this is Randall. And so we have purchased with Wharf uh, the, uh, the old Randall Towers here and we're going to work with the city to close that little piece of Johnson Street so we can build a bigger Union South that goes right out to Johnson Street and connects with the new Institutes for Discovery as a center for the engineering campus, the IT computer science campus, the bioscience and CALS campus. Um, this will be a, a great new addition. And you can also see that we're looking at having open space facing Dayton Street on the south side, so that now there's a plaza at Union South, so there's some outdoor amenities as well. That will make it a lot more attractive as well. Um, and this just shows some of the preliminary schematic designs for Union South, this is where Johnson Street is today. That's the piece we're going to try and close. And Randall Towers, we're purchasing so that we can move this whole development right out facing the street and really make it a more of a gateway to campus between the Institute for Discovery and the new Union South. And then this highway building will take down, and that will be part of a courtyard to the south of the new Union South, looking at it this way. 
uh, with a memorial union. Mostly this is a restoration, uh, particularly focusing on the theater wing, getting a new dis, uh, dis, uh, accessible entrance. Uh, the, when you go into the union on that side, it's just crazy. You go down, you go through a narrow hallway, you go down, you go up, you don't know where you're going, can't get anywhere. So we're, gonna, we're designing a new entrance on the ground floor that's accessible, uh, that gets you both to the theater wing and to the central part of the union. Um, we're also looking at a, at a big clear addition on the back uh, that can be used for receptions with the theater and also be a winter garden for viewing the terrace in the wintertime when it's a little chilly to be out there as well. So you can see that little addition shows here and what it would, might look like uh, in this picture. Um, I've talked a little bit, Sterling Hall is going to be, we'll, probably within the next year, we'll get in and start remodeling that. Uh, now that physics has moved into Chamberlain, we've got a big empty building, now's the time for us to remodel it. And we are getting the final funding for that from the legislature, hopefully tomorrow, which is where I was this morning. And hope, emphasis on hopefully. Uh, Education is another great project. Uh, we have a $31 million donation from John and Tasha Morgridge to completely uh, renovate this historic Bascom building. It originally was engineering. So as you walk up the sidewalk and you see the names of 10 famous engineers on the education building, that's why. It, for the first 20 years, this was the engineering building on campus until they moved out. And this is a great facade facing uh, Bascom. But like a lot of other things, the back facing the lake is just a mess. Um, so this is where we're really going to focus our attention architecturally. We're going to do the renovation, interior renovation of all this area. But we're going to build a new wing on the lower side and then build a courtyard, a raised courtyard in this area uh, that can be shared by all of that area. Um, and so we are now recapturing this great view of Muir Knoll and the lake from education, so it becomes a building really with two front doors, a door to Bascom Hill and a door to Lake Mendota. Uh, the Chazen, likewise, is another one of those additions. Uh, this one, we're keeping the Elvium building and building another building where the Peterson building is today, and then linking it up with gallery space so that it feels like one whole new museum, which will be a really spectacular effect because this goes right across the new East Campus Mall that we're building. So from this area, as you go through this gallery, the glass hallway in the back will have views right down to the lake and the terrace across Library Mall. So it should be a really spectacular area. And at night, as you go through the East Campus Mall, it's just a very inviting setting uh, for the museum now to become a much more visible part. I mean, unfortunately, the way it was designed, it just feels like it's, it disappears in the shadow of humanities and it doesn't have its own identity. Now it will have this whole front uh, facing University Avenue um, and this great access and we're still going to build a courtyard in this area so we have a couple really big buildings here we need to step that down and give us some space across University Avenue so that it's a more comfortable gracious entrance. This is the honeysuckle and buckthorn I was talking about earlier. This is your view of the lake on the Lakeshore Path. It's great. Uh, you can't see a damn thing. Um, so what we've done is uh, if you walk down the Lakeshore Path today, there are four or five openings that we did this winter uh, where we went in and cleared out the honeysuckle and buckthorn and opened up the views, left the trees behind, did erosion control along the way, and planted some uh, ground cover uh, that are native plants. And so now as you walk along the Lakeshore Path, you're going to start seeing openings the way it was when it was an oak savanna. And we have plans to do similar things out on Picnic Point where we're starting to create openings through that invasive species. So the future is quick. Uh, this is the way the East Campus looks today. This is the way we think it'll be. Actually, most of this will be done in the next five years. Uh, so a really huge transformation there. Out west, um, with the development of inside the ring road, we know we're going to, in the next 20 years, we're going to need to grow. So we want, I've been wanting to get rid of this giant surface concrete mess for my whole career here. So we put that in the plan that uh, surface parking goes into ramps. So here's a ramp uh, that will in part take care of lot 60. And then there's another ramp by where the Biotron is today. That building will come down and we'll have more parking and structured parking there. But the rest of this is an opportunity for more health science research. It could be a nursing building. It could be 
additional research. It could be more academic space for the medical school. Um, a variety of, so this is not programmed, but it fills up the area where the track and soccer field in lot 85 is today, and then moves that green space over to the lake so that all these developments can share the views of the lake and we get rid of that giant concrete block that runs off into the stormwater and gives us all more permeable space. So that's the view of the west. Well, here we've designed all these in the last four years and, and we, we're trying to create a, hosp, uh, a west campus architectural style, if you will. And frankly, you can see a lot of that now and you'll see more of it even when you see the fingers of the new IRC because we're using the same architectural vocabulary. We're going to use Casota stone, we're going to use the yellow brick, uh, and we're going to use windows that are similar to those areas. And even though the shapes of the building may be different, you're going to see a lot of the similar exterior materials. You don't see that yet on the IRC. They will be there. What it is is in, when we do a master plan, we want to make sure we have the capacity to grow and we've identified the places where we want to grow and where we don't want to grow, where we have green space, right. where we have parking. So that's what this goal is to lay out where we want to grow, where we don't want to grow. The schedule really is probably going to come after all of the IRC development is done. Um, then we're going to jump across the street and we can probably build one building where lot 85 is, one like that building right. could get built and still leave the track and soccer field there. And then when we have to grow past that, that's when the big, then we have to build a parking ramp, get rid of lot 60, and move the track and soccer field over to create another developmental lot, if you will. So it's really gonna be, it's ready to go whenever we need the capacity. Oh. So this is the uh, old Wisconsin and Southern line. Um, it, we're on transport 2020 working on commuter rail. So as part of that, Part of that job in our plan, we've identified three stops um, as part of that plan. One in the vicinity of the hospital complex, either on Farley or on Highland, it could go either place. Another stop is, is right here by Union South and the Institute for Discovery. Another stop is down here by the Cole Center. Um, so we're actively working with the county um, on the federal application for that commuter rail uh, project and I think we'll be submitting um, our proposal for funding in July. Well, I don't think you see any kind of, of daylighting is now one of our preeminent um, architectural drivers, not only because it provides a better work environment, but it also just makes a lot of sense from an energy standpoint as well. One of the reasons you see those three fingers of buildings coming out for research is it then allows light to penetrate the entire lab floor including all the offices. And even in probably the only area that won't have windows would be the support space where your autoclaves are and things like that. Other than that, these buildings are gonna be very transparent. And that's one of the reasons you don't see big, thick buildings anymore is the, the need for daylighting is part of our overall design. Just to, I wanna show you one thing about parking because we've talked a little bit about it. We have analyzed the amount of surface and parking that we have on campus and put it all in purple here. Um, and if you threw that all together and just paved 98 acres of land, that's how big it would be. Um, which is why we're in a campaign to gradually get rid of surface parking because of where we are, we have the lake, we have downtown, we have South Madison, we have University Heights and we have Shorewood. We don't have any place for, to grow. Uh, geographically anymore. That's, for 150 years that was our trend. It's not our trend anymore. We have a capacity of how much we can grow, even adding density. And so the way we're handling this is, as you see, more and more ramps are either going under buildings or in, or ramps rather than surface parking. And if we stack that up in three levels, we are gaining 65 acres of land for either development or green space on campus. And so that's kind of the plan to end up with more green space, particularly north of University Avenue. So we want to capture more green space on Linden Drive, uh, where the food research comes down. You can see the development. We're looking at taking the visitor ramp out in front of the hospital and burying it and creating a big green courtyard there. Uh, once again, this is also not only practical, but it's wayfinding. So people coming either from the new driveway, uh, the new road on Observatory or Highland 
can see the front door and then get to the front door. Uh, it's a whole new concept. Um, and then you can see the developments we've put around pharmacy include big green courtyards along as more green space uh, along where track and soccer would replace the lot 60. So overall, we're going more vertical with parking. Well, having worked in the athletic department, uh, football games, frankly, are going to happen, uh, whether we want them to or not. And uh, uh, as we schedule out projects, uh, we are very cognizant of those fall special events that are going to drive 80,000 people in here. Um, and we frequently shrink the construction footprint for those days and then put them back out Sunday for Monday when we do that. And then we try and do scheduling where we are wrapping up projects in August rather than starting projects so that we can free up spaces. But uh, the, pro the, the projects that are really disruptive are the utility projects, not necessarily the building projects. So as we build the Institute for Discovery, the staging area is going to be here on Orchard Street. It's not going to be in University Avenue or it's not going to be in Johnson. There may be a one lane closure like there is on University Square for deliveries and things like that. But then we'll have to slide those three lanes over. We won't lose capacity, but it will get, it'll get a little dicier. There's no question about it. But at the same time, we're in a city. That's what happens. Uh, we have to manage it as best we can and do it as safely as we can. And that's, that's how we'll develop on University and Johnson. But the really disruptive ones are like what we're doing here. We're literally tearing up the road, digging down 15 feet, putting in all the steam and chilled water piping, and, and then gradually putting it all back together. Those are really time-consuming projects. I mean, it'll take us a year and a half to do this one. It'll take us more than a year and a half to do that East Campus. Those are the disruptive ones. Maybe one more question. Well, the, the main development of the 50s and 60s was driven by the panic-stricken need to throw up buildings fast to deal with the baby boomers. And as a result, the buildings that we're tearing down today were built really fast, really cheaply, short, uh, short longevities with pretty bad equipment. Um, and it was all about speed and budget in the 50s and 60s. And we are spending more money now on a building to try and give it a 100-year life as a result. Um, so we're, we're not going to repeat those uh, issues. The other one is, you know, unfortunately, you live with it, you deal with the realities of the times you live in. And hopefully, we can, if we get enough momentum on this plan and on the design, that, and the design principles that we have, we'll be able to hold on and sustain this vision until, until something better comes along. So thanks a lot. Sorry, it's late.